Good evening. I'm Daniel Benjamin, and I'm the president of the American Academy in Berlin, and I am absolutely delighted to welcome you to uh, the bio lecture in health and, and biotech entitled Truth and Trust in Public Health. Uh, I am really thrilled that this lecture will be delivered by Harvey Feinberg, president of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, former president of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine, as well as former provost of Harvard University and dean of the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Uh, in a sense, this week at the Academy is the week of the fabulously honored and decorated. Uh, earlier this week, we hosted the historian Margaret McMillan, who has a veritable alphabet soup after her name uh, in all the official places because of all the different designations and honors that she has acquired. And tonight, with Harvey Feinberg, we have Margaret's medical and public health match. Harvey will, for, will be formally introduced momentarily tonight. I have a less august task, but um, I would be remiss if I did not note to you that if you Google Harvey, uh, you will have to work your way through a veritable forest of press releases of the prizes and honorary degrees that he has accumulated over the years, uh, including a, an honorary doctorate uh, from Harvard University, uh, a rare honor usually reserved for heads of state and people who discover new small subatomic uh, particles. Um, Harvey doesn't make it easy for you uh, to determine uh, all the different honors and doctorates uh, he has um, because his official bios are frustratingly and humbly vague on this subject, or should I say vaguely humble. In any case, um, <laughs> He's done a good job uh, covering his tracks. Um, perhaps the best way to sum it up is uh, in the words of one of our distinguished visitors earlier in the semester, Jeff Feltman, uh, himself no slouch as the former undersecretary for political affairs at the UN. Uh, Jeff took stock of his academy colleague and looked at me and said, you know, Harvey is really important. <laughs> Jeff also spoke for us all at the Academy when he noted uh, that not only was Harvey really important, uh, as is his distinguished wife and co-buyer uh, fellow, Mary Wilson, but they are both totally unaffected, engaging, and a complete delight to have here at the Academy. So um, as many of you know, the Buyer Fellowship in Health and Biotech is one of the newest additions to the Academy's fellowship program. And with this fellowship, the Academy aims to contribute to um, sustainable innovation in the field of health and biotech by supporting interdisciplinary dialogue uh, between representatives from the academic, corporate, political, and public sectors. Each year, the Academy will bring one, or in this case, two brilliant minds from the US to Germany, uh, where they will meet with counterparts and experts uh, to exchange ideas. Uh, we couldn't be more pleased that Harvey Feinberg has accepted our invitation to come to Berlin um, together with his wife as the second corporate uh, Bayer Fellows. Uh, Bayer Fellows. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Bayer uh, Age and in particular Oliver Renner, who's here tonight, and his colleagues who have made this possible and for generously sponsoring this fellowship uh, and for consistently supporting the Academy's work since 2004. As the Academy relies entirely on private funding, the support is crucial uh, for us to produce a high quality program that brings the very best from America to Germany uh, in the spirit of international exchange. So tonight we have a special guest who will do the honors of introducing our buyer fellow, and I have uh, the honor of introducing the introducer. Uh, a household name for the German public in recent years, and specifically during the pandemic, uh, Professor Dr. Lothar Wieler. Now, before accepting his current position at the Hasso Plattner Institute, just a bit down the road at uh, the University of Potsdam, Professor Wieler was president of the Robert Koch Institute, Germany's premier public health institute, uh, the mission of which is to protect and improve the health of the German population. Um, 
Professor Wheeler has published uh, more than 250 scientific papers, uh, which is kind of a mind-boggling number. And he has also been awarded several scientific uh, prizes. Among them, he's a member of the Lancet Commission on 21st Century Global Health Threats. He is a senator of the Leopoldina Section for Global Health. He is co-chair of the Working Group on Influenza Preparedness and Response at the World Health Organization. And uh, during the pandemic, he served as chair of the International Health Regulation Review and Committee. Um, it is really an honor to have one of Germany's most prominent voices on public health joining us here at the Academy uh, to welcome one of America's most important voices uh, on public health. And um, before I turn the podium over to Professor Wieler, let me just say uh, a word or two about the structure uh, of the evening. Uh, Harvey's talk will last about 30 minutes. It will somehow incorporate or deal with the pieces of paper on your seats. I'm not quite sure how. Um, uh, it's always wonderful when we have a mystery involved in our presentations. Uh, if you are here at the Academy, you know what to do. If you want to, if you want to ask a question, if you're joining us via Zoom, uh, please, uh, you can start typing at any time. Uh, put your question in the Q&A part of the Zoom platform, and we apologize in advance if we can't get to every one of the questions. And with that, Professor Wheeler, the microphone is yours. Yeah, thank you too much. Um, actually, it's an honor for me to be able to introduce to you Harvey Feinberg, um, a renowned scientist, particularly in the area of health policy. And uh, I decided not to go through his bio too extensively because of time issues. I want him to give more time to bring forward his very valuable concepts and ideas. But let me clarify that Harvey Feinberg is a person that has put a lot of effort in understanding how you make decisions, decisions in a medical field and in particular, and this is outstanding because usually these are two separated fields, both in the area of health care as well as in the area of public health. And these are two different entities and particularly when you look and think about it in Germany, two different entities which have really, particularly the public health entity has gained pace during the COVID-19 pandemic so much. And the world has said that the COVID-19 pandemic has been a public health crisis, less than a health care crisis. And if you look at the awards that have been, the prizes and awards that have been awarded to Harvey Feinberg, and if you look at the number of publications he has set up. And if you look at the books he has written, you always understand that's a person who isn't really, he's in depth in understanding people, serving the people, serving the patients, serving the goods. And what I particularly like when I read through your bio is, you put a very strong effort on decision making in the area of era of healthcare, but also public health, and you moved very much into the global health era. And when we look at your positions, I mean, being the president of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine, or now also being, and I found it very stunning that you are a member of the China Medical Board, which could also give us some insight on your talk. I'm not sure about this, whether this was helpful or not. But if you look about all these different stages that whenever a certain health crisis popped up, you delineated it and made sense of what happened. I'm very much looking forward to your talk today, and I think we learn a lot from you, because when you put it down in our society, when something, whether you have a good structure, a health structure or not, it all really boils down to trust in each other, trust in institutions, trust in people. And when I had a lecture today in, in Copenhagen, a keynote lecture on the AMR pandemic, which I consider to be a silent pandemic, but which now also gained weight because many politicians understood that they need sound data to make the right decisions, I thought a lot about why did some 
issues work and others not. And you clarified this all in your books. It's all about trust. You need strong institutions, but if they're not trusted, they're useless. So I'm very much looking forward to your talk, and, and I'm really humbled that I'll be able to introduce you. Thank you very much, Dr. Feinberg. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Wieler and uh, Daniel, thank you so much for your incredibly gracious introductions. I'm very pleased to see all of you, but I'm especially happy that my wife, Mary Wilson, is here because I know she would very much like to meet the gentleman you've been describing. <laughs> uh, it was... Uh, also, I, I just have to make a small observation that uh, Daniel, in his generosity of introduction, uh, managed also to escape with all the papers that I had placed in front of me for the purpose of the lecture. I think that was in a vain hope that his 30-minute <laughs> deadline might actually be honored. I can only say they'll do me more good than they'll do you. <clears throat> but it gives me an opportunity also, uh, Daniel, to express for Mary and me our sincere gratitude to you. Uh, Henrique, thank you. Uh, thank you to all the staff here. This is an incredible institution, as uh, all of you here must surely know. And we have felt so privileged to be able to take part uh, not simply in the amenity and environment for work, but quite honestly in the eminent and very, very engaging fellows who join each year to be part of this enterprise. I'm going to be speaking with you uh, this evening on a subject of truth and trust uh, in public health. Uh, interestingly, uh, in just a couple of weeks, uh, when Mary delivers her talk, it will be on antimicrobial resistance. So already we have, I think, some continuity uh, between the two of us privileged to hold the Bayer Fellowship. And thank you, Oliver, so much for that support. Uh, let me begin with some background premises uh, about uh, truth and trust in public health. Uh, it's the case that science is the basis of truth-telling in public health. But if science is the rock that we stand upon, it can be slippery and uneven. It's true that everyone wants certainty and easy decisions. But in fact, public health is replete with uncertainty and with difficult decisions. It's true that the facts should speak for themselves, but in reality, they seldom do. And indeed, all messages, as we'll come to discuss, are framed by the messenger, by the content, and by the context in which they are delivered. Yes, all of us who are immersed in science are conditioned to learn and understand that the plural of anecdote is not evidence. But people crave stories, ask any journalist, and they're memorable and often convincing. Yes, the internet amplifies lies and misunderstanding. A professor of statistics of mine used to observe that it is easy to lie with statistics. It is even easier to lie without them. But the internet is not our only problem. I'm going to try to cover briefly three fundamental underlying complexities in framing, delivering, and affecting health communication. First, the vagaries of science. Second, the prevalence of uncertain and difficult decisions. And then very importantly, and I think even today still inadequately appreciated, the importance of framing and bias in the way we both deliver and understand scientific and health messaging. So let's begin with a story about the vagary of science. Some of you may recall the film Sleeper. Now, 50 years ago, Woody Allen's 
not greatest movie, but notable. It was set 200 years into the future. And when the character played by Woody Allen awakens what is now only 150 years in the future, he's confronted by two scientists. Dr. Melick says this morning for breakfast, he requested something called wheat germ, organic honey, and tiger's milk. Dr. Aragon chuckles and says, oh yes, those are the charm substances some years ago were thought to contain life-preserving properties. Melick says, you mean there was no deep fat, no steak or cream pies or hot fudge? Obviously, Melick, by the way, had not eaten here at the academy, but okay. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Aragon says, ah, those were thought to be unhealthy, precisely the opposite of what we now know to be true. And Dr. Melick says, incredible. But think about our dietary advice. It wasn't so long ago the doctors told us to avoid butter and use stick margarine instead. Until, over time, it became evident that the trans fats in stick margarine were even less healthy than the butter fat in butter. More recently, uh, adult men who had been told a baby aspirin a day could be very good for staving off heart disease have now been told, oh, never mind, it doesn't seem really to pan out. And uh, I remember in 1981 when the first report came out that coffee was associated with cancer. Subsequently, no, it may even be protective, we think today, so I've started drinking coffee. <laughs> is red wine unhealthy or is it healthy? Well, the latest says, no, not so good for you. I prefer the older evidence, but <laughs> the point here is that perhaps we ought to condition Dr. Aragon to be a little less confident about what is, quote, now known to be true. Now, I want to pose a decision problem. Suppose, now, actually, uh, if Anna were to pose this problem, we'd probably believe it, but let me just pose it. Suppose we're here in this room. There's one door that's the exit. And I tell you, if you walk through that door, you will die. But if you remain in the room, you will live. Setting aside the question of how long am I going to keep talking and would it actually be worth it, let's assume for a moment you believe the premise of the question. Would you stay or would you leave? Easy. You stay. Why, why is it so easy? What, what's so simple about this? Well, first, it's only two options. Stay, go. There's no uncertainty. I told you if you walk out, you're dead. If you stay, you live. It's immediate. It's a very stark choice. And there's only one attribute that is at stake. It's your life. And it's entirely your call. I said you could sit or you could go. And the best choice is really obvious. If you value your life, you're going to stay put. How is this different from the real world? Let's imagine a decision space at the origin, this single attribute, certain and immediate de decision. But the world is filled with many considerations. In health, for example, we always think about benefit and risk and cost and many, many other elements of contribution. Life is not filled with certainty. It's rife with uncertainty. It's not exactly sure what will happen if you do what you may choose to do. And the consequences don't arise instantly. They play out over time. So in everyday life, if we think about this decision space, we live somewhere out in the multi-attribute, uncertain, and future consequence real world. But it's only possible and easy for us to make choices when it's simple, single, clear-cut, immediate, and obvious. So what do we do? Well, there are techniques to try to cope with the difference between the real world and how we can easily make decisions. 
And uh, one of them I'll just allude to is called decision analysis, which is applicable when decisions have to be made, events are uncertain, and there are multiple discrete, differentially valued outcomes that exist. In the use of this method, multiple outcomes are converted to decisionally equivalent, simpler choice between the best and worst outcome by means of something called utility assessment. Uncertainties are converted into the equivalent decisionally of the overall expectation through the use of probability. Delay in time is converted to the equivalent of immediate by means of discounting and a complex situation of which it's impossible to keep it all in our minds at one time to be able to think it all through without losing track or getting distracted. There are models that we can apply to help sort this all out. And so uh, that's not a bad way to go, but it only takes us so far. And that brings me to the sheet of paper on your seat. Now's the time, if you haven't already, to please take a look and read it and think about your answer. Anyone need more time? Have you got your answer? Okay. Now, some of you have a sheet of paper at the top says choose A or B, and some of you have a sheet of paper that at the top says choose C or D. I believe it's that side that's A and B, A or B, is that right? Okay. Uh, by show of hands, how many people prefer A? It looks like about just over half. How many prefer B? A little less than half, but a good number. How many just won't tell me? <laughs> Pretty good. Okay. C and D. How many prefer C? Darn few. And how many prefer D? Almost everyone. So in this group, D is much, much more popular than C. And in this group, it's pretty close, but there were a few more A's than B's. All right. Now, let's draw the curtain back and see what were these questions about. They actually relate to a study that was done in 1981 by Kahneman and Tversky. Daniel Kahneman, uh, more recently, was awarded a Nobel Prize for his work like this that led to the field of behavioral economics. And here is the choice that is between A and B. The first paragraph you've all read because that's identical. Choice A says 200 people will be saved. And choice B says a one-third probability 600 will die sorry, 600 will be saved, and a two-thirds probability that no one will be saved. And here, slight favorite A over B, but very close. C and D, same first paragraph. Choice C said, if C is adopted, 400 people will die. One lonely soul chose C. Apparently, doesn't care, but okay. <laughs> if program D is adopted, there's a one-third probability nobody will die, and a two-thirds probability 600 will die. So what's interesting about this comparison is that they're mathematically identical. Do you all see that? That there's 600 in jeopardy, a is 200 are saved, which means 400 die. C, which was the other first choice, said 400 will die, which means 200 are saved. And so on with B and D being absolutely mathematically equivalent. So if analytically A is equivalent to C and B is equivalent to D, what's the difference? And the difference is this. A versus B are framed as gains, saving. C versus D are framed as losses, dying. And it makes a difference, as we've seen. In fact, the studies that have been done from the beginning show a majority of people prefer A to B, and a larger majority prefer D to C. 
I'll tell you, I've looked at this many times myself, and if I just try to free my mind of what I know about it and just think about the problem as posed, I like A and I like D. And I'm supposedly a rational human being, but I know that's not right. But I know it's very powerful. And it's something that those of us concerned about honest, truthful communication need to be very mindful of. Now, let me just show you a figure that I also find very compelling in this way. Look at that figure. How many would say line on top is longer, the horizontal line? How many would say the line below is longer? You've all seen this. <laughs> I've seen it a thousand times. And I look at it and I feel like Chico Marx in the movie Duck Soup, where he said, who you gonna believe, me or your own eyes? <laughs> because I'm telling you, I drew it, and I know they're actually the same. This idea of framing carries over in other ways too. For example, in risk communication, just to pick one example, if you present relative efficacy data as a comparative difference as opposed to an absolute difference, it can be much more compelling. For example, if you say this drug will, will reduce your risk of malaria by 50%, that gets people's attention. But if you tell them your risk is going to go from 20 per thousand to 10 per thousand, mm, not as interesting. Now here's a hypothetical, another question and Dr. Wheeler, I'm going to ask you first, because you have done this. There's an emerging respiratory virus that has afflicted other countries and is moving steadily toward your country. Everywhere this outbreak has struck, everywhere, 30% of the population has died. There is a new vaccine that is perfectly protective against the disease but it also has side effects that are fatal in 10%. Should you deploy this vaccine in the face of the inevitable spread of this pandemic? Now, I want you to set aside doubts about the premise, which is always our first recourse. Is it really true that it's, com it's coming? Suppose you know it's coming. Would you deploy this vaccine? You'd like to get away from both. <laughs> well, this is an explanation of Dr. Wheeler's lifelong success. <laughs> oh, 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 uh, let me ask, how many of you would use the vaccine as opposed to, you know, get out of it? In the, oh, a lot of you. Okay. Oh, you know what? I got it just backwards. It's actually... The outbreak kills 10% and the vaccine kills 30%. And now, how many are going to use that vaccine? Uh, nobody. And this is such an easy question. And the other question made us think. Why was the first one hard and this one not so easy? Well, it gets back to Benjamin Franklin who described his own experience losing a son to smallpox because, in his mind, he had failed to inoculate his son. Inoculation in those days, by the way, was much more dangerous than vaccine for smallpox, which came later in the 18th century. But he berates himself for having chosen a way that was riskier and that he would never forgive himself either way. But what this is revealing is that in public health, when it comes to prevention, we tend to avoid errors of commission. We feel very badly if we've done something that has harmed a healthy person. And interestingly, I would say, getting back to this question of comparison of medicine and public health, that in diagnosis and treatment among currently ill patients, 
we tend to be biased against errors of omission. We tend to want to intervene, to do things, because in the second case, our default assumption is it's an ill patient who's going to get worse. And in the first case, the default assumption, it's a well person, we shouldn't do anything to make that person worse. So in public health, we have a bias against errors of commission. I would just say it's worth thinking about. Is that how we would want to make choices with that bias guiding in part how we think about the issue? So uh, in public health, there are a few common biases I just want to highlight. One is we tend to overweight these errors of commission. And that's always a struggle. A second very common is that you overweight your own data. I love epidemiology and epidemiologists. I love scientists. But most of us are more trusting of our own results than we are of anyone else's, regardless of anything else about the circumstance. And I sometimes say it's easier to see a pebble in your neighbor's lawn than to recognize a boulder sitting on your own roof. So we're much more attuned to shortcomings in someone else's data. A third common bias is overconfidence. And this especially comes to the fore in a case like a pandemic, when the actual experiences of pandemics are rather sparse. They don't occur very regularly, but you have a long time to think about them between their occurrences, and that tends to reinforce the convictions that you bring to the question. And so there's a tendency to overstate confidence and even to overfeel confidence relative to data. And finally, for some, there's a risk of overextending their own expertise. You might say this is an occupational hazard for physicians. I'm reminded of the story of the physician who died and came naked before the pearly gates to St. Peter. And as they were beginning to talk, the physician notices in the difference someone walking around with a white coat and a stethoscope. And so he interrupts the conversation and says, excuse me, St. Peter, but uh, how does one get the white coat and the stethoscope? I'm a physician. St. Peter looks and says, oh, uh, that, that's God. He just likes playing doctor every once in a while. <laughs> there's, there's a risk of overextending uh, expertise. Now, let me just highlight three common dilemmas in public health communication. The first I call the balance of 5149 evidence against 100 zero action. What do I mean by that? Very often, the evidence available at the time you have to make a choice is murky. It's not very clear cut. It's a very close call. But what you do is definitive, decisive, requires action. So you have a lot of consequence against a very, very close call. And that's a problem. Another one, journalists, I call the 99-1 communication dilemma. We know what prejudicial and biased journalism is, but what exactly is balanced journalism? If 99% of scientists agree about climate change, is a balanced article one that quotes one of those and the one out of a hundred so that you get both points of view? And then the newest evidence conflation. Uh, does new knowledge necessarily mean it's better? We read about the latest study. For example, in the case of the pandemic, uh, there was a study uh, that came out of the Cochrane Collaborative, a very eminent and uh, very well-respected group that talked about the efficacy of face masks, very easily misunderstood what they were trying to say, and the way they approached the question was actually 
answering the wrong question that people were actually interested in, but it was the most recent study. So does that mean uh, it's better? So recency is a potential problem. The 99-1 communication dilemma comes up over and over again in journalism. And this close call that leads to definitive action, that is the constant daily experience of public health. So let me just summarize with a few key points. Science is a dynamic and evolving web of knowledge. It is not fixed forever. It is constantly reshaped by new data, new evidence, and new understanding. We have to learn to love and live with probability because the world is, in its nature, uncertain. Framing effects and bias are more powerful than you might imagine. And understanding that is important both if you want to convey information that is persuasive and if you want to convey it in a way that gives the listener, whether a policymaker or a member of the public, every opportunity to think about the problem from both points of view, gains and losses. If we want to be successful and have the opportunity, which is not always the case, testing the messaging and the messages with the intended audience is the surest way to refine and correct error in the way you are going to communicate. Hallmarks of sound public health communication include timeliness, accuracy, clarity, consistency, focused, appropriate to the audience, and often repeated. It is remarkable how few people absorb almost any message on first hearing. Marketers know that very well. Public health needs to understand and learn that as well. Let me just conclude by saying to be trusted, public health leaders must first prove themselves to be trustworthy. Thank you very much. My first message, and it fits. <clears throat> if you use digitalization, but the data you pose to us, sorry, if you use uh, digital means and computers and pose these questions, they will realize right away that because there's no personal psychology behind that the questions are identical to the same problem and they find the same solution. So is the answer to your trust or not trust, uh, getting you know the bias of individual people out of the way and use the computer? My own feeling is uh, we don't want to turn, I don't want to turn responsibility for decisions over to a computer without uh, human oversight, intervention, and judgment. I, I don't myself believe that is the solution to this problem. I prefer to think that humans aided by computer would be the strongest combination to ensure that we both have the benefit of the objective analysis and the ability to impose values and other considerations that may not be as easily incorporated into the premise of the question. Uh, for example, in public health, there's often a consideration of the current decision's impact on longer-term capacity to protect health. And that's not only a consideration about the immediate question, but also a consideration of how this choice will affect the public's willingness to adhere, abide, and listen over time. So I would... I would say, yes, a computer would instantly recognize that these are equivalent. And indeed, most people, if given both, would see that the two choices are equivalent. Uh, the, the difficulty is most of the time we haven't the luxury mm -hmm. of the collaboration with the computer, nor the benefit always of seeing the question from both sides. Please, yeah. For the yeah, please. I think uh, that's 
a good idea. Thank you. My name is Odette Wegwert. I'm a Heisenberg Professor for Medical Risk Literacy and uh, Evidence-Based Decision at the Charité. I have a question that uh, um, puts on the question uh, Professor Ganten just uh, asked. You said at the end the hallmarks of sound uh, public health communication is that it's clear and correct. And, uh, of course, we can't have always a computer around us, but a possibility would be that we just follow guidelines for transparent reporting of risk and uncertainty information. And during the pandemic and in general in public health campaigns, we always see that there's persuasive me messaging, uh, the use of relative risk information instead of absolute risk information. Yeah. And you tried to explain why that is so, but that prevents people from understanding clearly the benefit-harm ratio of uh, interventions and prevention programs we have. Yeah. And I wonder if we should more enforce transparent reporting of risk and also being open and clear about uncertainties, particularly during the pandemic, um, we often had not clear-cut scientific evidence, to let people know and still try to win them over to still follow us in the yeah. light of this uncertainty. And if this could somehow uh, enforce or empower uh, people uh, to, be, to make more informed decision-making so that we don't have always to make the decisions for them. Now, this is a very important uh, point, I think, of uh, debate and reflection, especially coming out of the COVID experience for political leaders as well as public health uh, experts and officials. Uh, when I referred to the idea that it needs to be clear and correct. That doesn't mean it's oversimplified or definitive. Clarity can be about the uncertainty. And correctness can be in explaining the nature of the evidence. The real practical problem I feel for uh, those who find themselves in the position of responsibility for the public's health even if they themselves are capable intellectually, emotionally, temperamentally to hold internally these ideas of uncertainty and, uh, and uh, ambiguity and be able to express it. If they believe the weight of evidence is such that it would truly be better for people to do something, take the vaccine, wear the face mask, Stay away from crowds. Don't attend the restaurant for now, etc. But they also believe if they described the exact weight of evidence today, even though persuasive to them as a public health leader, it wouldn't be enough to lead most people to take up that burden of avoiding something they enjoy or want to do. So you worry, as a public health official, if the individual decisions that are therefore made are going to work against the collective public health in time, even though it may be individually rational for that person to weigh for themselves the uncertainty that I've, as an expert, now given them, and they say, it's not that important to me, I'm going to go to the restaurant. But we know if everyone goes to the restaurant, then the ap epidemic will get much worse. This is where the dilemma, I think, really comes to the fore. Uh, in general, it would be better to do, as I think exactly where you were leading, to present the evidence, to then allow the individual to weigh the evidence and decide what is best for them. The real dilemma for public health comes when those individual rational choices based on the ambiguity, uncertainty of the current evidence collectively leads to a worse outcome. That's a real dilemma. Yeah, please. It's, it's not really particular in, in situations such uh, as the pandemic has been that I would say we leave them to their own decisions because, as you just said, this is a collective problem, and so we have to give some lead. Yeah. But I wonder if we still are open about uncertainties or how much we know or not know yet. Yeah. Uh, and then say, but in the light of that, we know, don't know where the journey goes. We, we really want you and ask you to follow uh, these uh, containment measures. Yeah. 
if we would at least make sure that we wouldn't lose so many people in conspiracy beliefs or other things. Because my impression was during the pandemic, because people felt that things were claimed with so much certainty and that uh, things were focused mainly on benefit ratios, but no nothing was said about potential side effects and so on, yeah. that this put some people in the situation that they tried to find information somewhere else. And yeah. uh, it could be a chance for us as public health um, professionals to be more open about it and still uh, uh, bring the people to do the stuff. So not to say it's your decision, that yeah. is our decision, yeah. but we are aware that we don't have full evidence or 100% uh, evidence yeah. at hand just to achieve more trust uh, or get more trust in yeah. people. I, uh, I agree completely with what you're describing. And it is so hard to do it. Uh, it's so hard to do it as a uh, under the press of real time events, the strain of uh, hours, uh, and the burden of consequences. But what you're describing would not only be healthier from the point of view of the immediate decision, uh, but I think it would have the salutary benefits that you describe of reducing recourse to conspiracy opening yourself to genuine doubt based on the overconfidence you may have expressed. And equally important, uh, you would preserve your credibility over time. You would prove yourself trustworthy and thereby to be trusted. So uh, there's a lot of virtue in what you're saying. You know, uh, the novelist Mark Twain once observed that if you always told the truth you wouldn't have to remember anything. And maybe for public health, we simply need not to carry the burden of so many memories. <laughs> but but I, I, I'd like to uh, come in here. Yeah, please. Um, I, I fully agree with what has been said. But obviously, we are not living in a world where only these public health experts talk to the people. So obviously... Um, there are various sources of belief, of information, and as we know, in particular, you believe those people whom do you trust personally, your peer group, basically. Yeah. So, however, mm -hmm. at least in a democracy as we are, in a pluralistic democracy, where open speech is one of the gifts that we have, how could you ever so linear think that only the message of certain people in a particular position drive the action of the population? Yeah. It doesn't work like this. No. So, and, and how then could you basically demystify or debunk these other mentionings and notions? Yeah. I, I mean, this is a... This is a real world situation. It's not yes. a it's not a lab situation where you yeah. you can prove like Kahneman all these nice experiments of Kahneman. Yeah. Would they prove to be relevant in a real time situation, yeah. real life situation? Let me set aside this last point because your earlier point also is so critical. Um, you know, uh, being a uh, truthful and uh, consistent clear communicator for public health, uh, as you were and are, it is no guarantee that people will listen to you. Uh, and they may, uh, for various reasons, uh, turn to other uh, less qualified sources. But the reason to be honest and clear and uh, accurate is not that it guarantees that people listen. It's in case they listen, you want it to have been correct. Sure. Yeah. And I think that that's a pretty strong motive. Yeah. Now, uh, you're raising you know, a deeper problem in society, which you know, if we really wanted to deal with, uh, we, would, we would begin talking about education of children uh, all through uh, their lives, because uh, the best protection is a prepared mind uh, who can recognize the difference between uh, malarkey and medicine. 
but uh, that is that's a big challenge. That's a long term challenge, and you know you don't have the luxury in the course of a of an immediate pandemic uh, saying yes, we need K to twelve education now much better. Okay, but in the meantime, people will die. So I think the um, the risk of of people being distracted, influenced, uh, even favoring those uh, places that are more spectacular, more uh, uh, outrageous, uh, uh, more entertaining, uh, that's, that's a part of life I, that we have to deal with. Uh, please, I, I, you're no, no, you yeah, yeah, well, so. So when we have to give numbers yeah, now. I, try to I think it's track of this. Johanna, whomever you give it to. And then you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm a political scientist and in charge of a think tank, policy think tank. So I come from a fairly different angle. Just one little remark first. When I heard you speak, I was reminded of my very first academic teacher, who was Eric Fögelin, a very eminent political scientist. And he had a sort of standard saying, it went like this, when the others start doing their numbers, you lean back and think, and you will have a result that is double as good in half the time. That was his sort of, <laughs> and I was reminded of that. No, but my question is, and picking up on what's just being discussed, would you suggest that in a obviously very sort of difficult situation, uh, the, the general public or a broader public should be involved in the anguish, anxieties, options, whatever? Or would you then still say, well, it will need a sort of benevolent dictator who will just uh, collect the evidence, collect the advice, and then say, this is the way we're going, yeah. as all politicians did during the COVID-19 pandemic everywhere? Yeah. yeah. This uh, is a, a very uh, important question about the role and attitude of the expert versus or in uh, connection with the public or the patient. And it has a very interesting analog in medicine, actually, because, uh, you know, styles of practice of medicine, I think we're all familiar, at least in my lifetime, with what I would call the autocratic style of doctor. This is what you have, this is what you do. If you don't like it, find another doctor. And then there's a movement of the opposite in which uh, what you have is complicated. It's not at all clear, but there are 43 relevant papers. I've collected them for you. Uh, take them home over the weekend and let me know on Monday what you've decided. And then there's, of course, the... Uh, partnership, which we like to advocate, but I actually believe the key for the clinician is understanding the needs of each individual patient and responding to that patient with directive, if they want directive, with support and information, if that's the way they can best manage their care, or as a partnership. And so the responsibility for adaptation is not the patient, it's the clinician. Now, it's trickier when you're speaking of public health authority where, well, there are many people and they have different preferences and different styles, and then you have to go back to the recourse. What is it that will most engage most of the people in a way that gives them ownership and confidence that they have made a thoughtful decision. They know it may not, not turn out ideally, but they can feel comfortable they've done the best they could with that information. That, I think, is the responsibility of the collective communicator who wishes to play the role of honest expert. Uh, yeah, so, back, back here. Yeah, I don't know. The microphone is there. So. Here. We'll follow the microphone. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, as a development economist, I've got more experience in developing countries in public health in that area. But I'm curious, if you look back over the last 50 years and across the world, can you 
uh, think of a particularly successful public health campaign that adheres to the principles you established uh, in your talk, uh, that that uh, you 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 would call perhaps best practice or good practice for the time in, it with, in which it was carried out. Is there a good practice example you can share with us that we might learn from today? Yeah. Well, there are many, many examples and many lessons. Uh, interestingly, uh, Dr. Howard Coe, who was the first holder of uh, the Bayer Fellowship here at the Academy, uh, spoke a year ago about the tobacco campaign globally. Uh, and I think that's a very telling example where uh, you're not dealing only with a natural phenomena in a virus, which is uh, uh, responsible, but you have very strong economic and other vested interests in the whole uh, chain of supply of tobacco products uh, around the world. And yes, it's not a complete success, but it is a dramatically successful global public health education campaign, really all growing out of science in the first instance, a series of uh, strategies, some of which worked better than others, over a period of sustained effort to lead to a much better uh, status today than was true 50 years ago. So uh, that has many lessons. You could point to uh, smallpox eradication, which was a much more technical achievement. Uh, from a global health uh, point of view, child health has been a remarkable success story. Child survival, mainly attributable to uh, improvements in core sanitation, immunization, and circumstance. This is a dramatic uh, change and success compared even to 25 years ago. So uh, I think there are many positive lessons as well as elements of frustration, perceived and actual failure, and other shortcomings. Uh, and to be, I would say, uh, successful, we have to be ready to learn from both. But I mean, you've even written the book yeah. about AIDS. Well, yes, uh, I mean, AIDS, HIV is another prominent example, globally, very nice uh, which has many elements of success. And interestingly, not what was considered first to be the key, which would be a vaccine. Yeah. In the absence of a vaccine, to have a condition which was at one time a death sentence to a lifetime manageable chronic ailment, and uh, I might add, from the point of view of international relations, from the U.S. vantage point, the president's emergency program for AIDS relief called PEPFAR, which uh, was arguably, after the Marshall Plan, the most successful U.S. effort in, in global uh, enterprise, uh, is another great, uh, great example. Yeah. And I mean, the use of condoms... The behavior yeah, condoms, changes uh, that's right. in AIDS. This is a Every huge element public came to health. Play. That really yeah. very successful example, I think. So there. Are, the mic is now. You just back to John. Okay. Bring the yeah, microphone, please. Yes. So um, I'm, I'm a fellow fellow of Harvey, and I've been very lucky to share the breakfast table and the lunch table. Um, so I love the talk, Harvey, and I, I wanted to ask you. I thought. Um, a lot of the concerns that you are addressing are the internal problems of science, you know, the uncertainty, the time frame, those, the time horizon. But I'm, I'm also very concerned with just a general attack on science and on expertise as a, a valid thing that we should listen to as, as fellow citizens. And so I'm wondering what, what is your, uh, you know, your recommendation for what should we as experts or scientists, how should we be uh, confronting that challenge, because I see it in public health and in, in many regulatory domains where the, the, the problem isn't the internal issues of science itself, but it's actually an attack on science as something we should value and listen to. Yeah. You know, one of the reasons an enterprise like the American Academy in Berlin matters is that it is a place where you can bring people and ideas together around the most profound challenges facing society and international relations. And the failure and declining trust in institutions of all kinds, 
It is science, but it's also the Supreme Court of the United States. It's also uh, business. It's also the military. Everywhere you look, the trend has been toward declining confidence and trust on the part of a larger public. And I think it's a, it's a concern that because of its breadth must have its underlying drivers not mainly or only in a particular field. That is, I don't think the problem for science is only that we need to strengthen the underpinning of science. We do. We need to make science more open, more reliable, more replicable. Uh, and we need to have better interpretation and so on. But I think you're striking at something that's really deeper in uh, the uh, attitude of everyone toward suspicion of expertise. Uh, is it because we're getting so much readier access to so many different uh, vantage points? Do we need to take up stronger mechanisms of, if you will, collective professional certification of certain critical ideas that would lend added credence because it's gotten that seal of approval? Do we need to provide ways of engaging with the public more directly in community forums and focus so that people are invested personally in a much uh, more routine and regular way with the world around them and with their beliefs? Unfortunately, I think the answer is yes to all of those and more uh, because it's a really profound, disturbing trend in, uh, in attitude uh, of the public. Uh, so as soon as you come up with the complete answer, I'll be the first in line <laughs> could, to hear. Could, I, I'd like to yeah, we'll dwell to on it. this. Yes, yeah. um, you know, there is... Um, um, we will soon publish a paper about... Um, the possibility to basically debunk this by doing this by social listening, so given a framework and, and um, that we particularly, if we identify certain wrong interpretations, mm -hmm. uh, fake news, however you call it, that you directly go on this and try to debunk it. What, what do you think of this idea? Is it, is it doable or does it depend on who is doing it again? Because of this course. person also must be trusted. Yeah. And what, what, is, what are your ideas yeah, about this concept? Who's going to debunk the debunkers? Exactly. You know, this, uh, exactly. It can go on to a, a perpetual change. I think the, the difficulty is when you are so overwhelmed with false information that gains currency, it's so difficult to really interrupt it. But this is why leadership and spokespersons in a way, uh, to come back to another element of this, I think we as experts, scientists, clinicians, public health leaders, experts in a field, I think we need to develop uh, meaningful and stronger partnerships with the world of celebrity, hmm. the world of entertainment, the world of leadership, where recognition and familiarity lend for many people an element of confidence and, uh, and trust. So if you have a, you know, to pick an actor from my generation, an Alan Alda, uh, you know, from MASH, and a great human being, but also one who has dedicated himself toward uh, strengthening communication about science. And we need dozens of those uh, in order to help maybe push back this tide of doubt and put it in a direction of uh, greater confidence. Some scientists, of course, want the public not only to believe the right things, but to believe them for the right reasons and not just because who said it. Uh, that is a tall order. It's a great ambition. In the meantime, I would say it would behoove us to get the right people to also say it. And before I hand over the mic to yeah. the next question, um, 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 scientific societies play a strong role. I mean, you have been president of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine. You are now in the U.S. National Academy in a board about the health threats of the 21st century. Yeah. And, and when, when I think about COVID-19, for example, 
there were um, various opinions from, from, from individuals. So if a society, a sound scientific society, if a society would give general, general knowledge, basically a majority knowledge, like saying, okay, to our belief, the current status of knowledge, we from the society, so from 95% of our members or so, they think that this virus is transmitted by this or that way. Would this help? Does, does this, it, do know, the societies uh, have a, a stake in there? It would be a very good experiment if we could do it. Uh, in the case of this uh, U.S. National Academies Committee, the audience was really the policymaker. Mm. It was incidentally broadcast to the public, but mm. the individuals mainly advising the senior political figures genuinely didn't know what to make of the evidence. Okay. So they actually, very importantly, they sought out and needed that advice. It was not foisted upon them without their needing it. Uh, and that was a very important element in the success of that level of, of uh, uh, advisory function. Uh, I, I really think it's very hard to have a uh, self-appointed group that is really prepared on any question that might come up in science because the ranges of expertise would be too broad and you run into the problem I did speak about of overestimating your own uh, level of knowledge and authority and feels you actually uh, are not as well equipped. So I think it's a tall order, but in the case of a pandemic, it's a very interesting experiment you could run. You know. I talked to Dr. Moreno, I think he's the yeah. current, yeah. In, in Copenhagen, yeah. and he said one well, issue is also there, of course, currently the U.S. Academy is, is mostly white men, of course, and so there's not so much diversity in there, yeah. which also uh, would be... Uh, it doesn't uh, help. No, it doesn't help, no? Yeah, yeah. very no. true. Please, there's... Thank you. I think I have to get up for you to see me. Um, thank you for a wonderful presentation. I'm, I'm always uh, impressed by the mm -hmm. how elegant the presentations here at the Academy are. Um, English is not my native language, so I, I hope you can understand me. Um, uh, if, if you hold the microphone a little closer, <laughs> sure. I will be able to Very good. hear you. Yeah, thank you. So I'm, a, I'm a health clinician, and an anecdote from the lab came to mind <clears throat> on the topic of uh, diversity. And, and I hope you can hear the, the baked-in question in my 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 uh, anecdote. I think it's based on a real study. There, uh, there were three groups of mice uh, put in in labyrinths. Uh, in one group, the mice were trained to find the, the cheese at the end uh, before entering the labyrinth. In the second one, none of the mice knew the way out. And in the third one, some of the mice knew the way out and some didn't. When they timed this, these mice, it paired like the last group, the one that was a little bit... Uh, Diverse, on average, made it out with the best time. While the second one, no, the first one, everyone knew the way out. They squabbled in the corners and, and stuff like that. So I guess my, my question is, if may there be something uh, healthy or may there be a societal gain in some of us making odd choices or unhealthy choices at individual level? Yeah. Yeah. Just on this uh, question, if I understand uh, the thrust and the main point, I feel there's a difference when the unhealthy choice affects you alone or predominantly. I mean, every one of us is connected, and so our health does affect some others, but not in the same way that a communicable disease and behavior can affect the health of everyone. And I think we, as a society, give and should give a higher latitude of independent self-thought and judgment of what to do in the first case beyond what we afford in the second because we have a social responsibility to all of our citizens uh, to protect them. So. Uh, I'm not sure which group of mice it would apply, but I feel that the 
uh, nature of the uh, responsibility and authority for the decisions when it's your health, by all means are yours. You may, the doctor may offer the, her guidance, the doctor may say what, uh, what she believes is the right thing for you to do, but in the end, it's your, it's your choice to have the surgery, not to have the surgery, to take the second course of therapy or to forego the course of therapy and so on. In the case of a communicable disease, everyone's health is at risk by virtue of what each of us decides. And I, in those instances, we have a, a higher order of responsibility and I would say rightly legal authority to impose more of the scientific judgment about what we are each able to do. So I don't know if that's exactly responsive to the question that you were asking, but I was reminded of uh, President Ronald Reagan when he was in a classroom in North Carolina and a student asked him a very general question about foreign affairs and he had just lost the Marine barracks in Beirut and he launched into a vigorous animated defense of US policy in the Middle East, baffling the children. <laughs> and afterward, the press corps uh, asked Marlon Fitzwater what was going on. And he said, the president delivered a perfect answer to a flawed question. <laughs> <laughs> Please, if, just choose. I mean, I, ca I, can't, I can't collect them. In the back, there's some. They will so, yeah. keep their hands up yeah. for the next round. Sebastian Haller from Robert Koch Institute. Um, I, I wonder about the timeliness, the hallmark of timeliness that you added, and um, whether this and I would like to challenge it, actually, because um, for the beginning of an outbreak, it's really true that we need to be timely. And, but, but there we only have standard options from field epidemiology training, and th there's not so much complex decision-making, and, um, and we can go into that timely. And then there comes a time in an outbreak, and when it spreads, where there actually would be more time, and we would need more time for reflection. And when we do so, as we did and for, with our standing committee for vaccinations, who have a very uh, solid um, standard operational procedure, went through the literature and hesitated to, um, to, to be too timely with uh, recommending uh, a vaccine that had not been fully evaluated yet. Then mm. the public pressure um, was, was so high and, um, and, and people were actually taking it as uh, too much hesitancy, being unmodern, and mm. what, what else we have to, to, to then cope with. So I, I think with the uh, hallmark of timeliness, may we change that to be just on time? And this changes throughout um, a pandemic or an epidemic. In the beginning, timeliness is really crucial, and, and then the, we would have had much more time for reflection, and it would Absolutely. have added to our sound public health advice had one let us um, be a little more reflective and hesitant. Yeah. What would you say? Yeah. Uh, well, I accept uh, very much your uh, excellent point. Uh, timeliness does not mean uniformly quick or fast. Timeliness is contextual and relative to the action required and the time required for that action. If you were just to imagine over time, in general, information accumulates and the need for decision has a peak and then a rapid diminution. The key to timeliness is to take fullest advantage of the available knowledge at that moment, the decision really has to be conveyed. So it could change during different phases of the pandemic, but timely is always relative to the necessity of the decision. We should have mentioned this during the pandemic. We didn't do it. <laughs> yeah. Where was he when you needed him? Huh? The timeliness so. politicians were missing, actually. So. Uh, thank you very much. I come from China. I'm a freelance journalist here. Um, because China pl <laughs> pl 
play a very big role <laughs> in the academic. So, uh, actually, at to today's topics about truth and um, trust. But in the case of China, and especially in the beginning of the academic, um, from the government, there's no truth at all. And from the public, they don't trust the government at all. But I think it worked because uh, in the later, uh, it, it was very strict and the people suffering a lot. But uh, I think uh, if we don't, we don't forget it, then in the following half a year or uh, one year, actually the other governments, or they say actually China government helped prevent or delay the spread of the academy to the other sides of the world. So I would say in this way we could understand that this measure, that the strict measure conducted by the government worked. But so how would you say that? It, it is not about truth it is, or it's not about trust. Actually it worked. And now then the question is that if we have a, we now have an, an unexpected uh, disease from nowhere, it doesn't matter now. So what could be the public health um, policy to make to be so strict like the beginning of the trial or <laughs> it takes time on the, because it's un very uncertain. Yeah. So, thank you. Well, thank you for uh, the question. I, I don't know if everyone could, uh, could hear, but basically about the uh, policy in China, especially early, very strict, that uh, produced a lot of uh, reduction in the spread uh, in China in the first year of the pandemic and even beyond. Uh, you know, any discussion, I have to say, b uh, about uh, China's response and the U.S. response is always uh, uh, fraught with, with uh, interpretation mm -hmm. of serving a larger political uh, agenda because uh, the political overlay to all of these uh, decisions and actions uh, is very, very strong. So I would uh, offer observations that are just uh, personal, and I say this as someone who uh, has been a long-time uh, visitor and uh, collaborator with colleagues in, uh, in China for... Uh, well, more than 50 years. I'm looking at, uh, is it more than 50? Oh, not quite 50 yet. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I should know that. <laughs> it's 48 years that we, since we first met. It's uh, very close to 50, and for public health, that's not such a big difference. Um, anyway, what did China do at the beginning? Uh, what it did well was introducing very strict control measures that would work against a virus as long as the virus was not so readily transmissible that even those strong restrictions would not be enough. What did China do poorly at the beginning? It did very poorly for the world in not releasing information about the origins. And even today, the debate about the origins is going to continue because uh, the information is just not going to be sufficient without that early accurate information. Uh, China did very well in uh, sharing the virus originally. Mm. Uh, China did less well in not using any vaccine except that produced domestically, which it uh, produced a usable vaccine, but not really the best possible vaccine. Surprisingly, China did not do very well immunizing older citizens. It did pretty well, but uh, the conventional idea that whatever the Chinese government would say, people would do, uh, not always, not always. And uh, in the case of the last year of the pandemic, the uh, inability to gauge relaxation of restriction against the state of public readiness mm. created a tremendous amount of unrest uh, within China 
and uh, caused much disruption. Uh, overall, the, we don't really know the number of people uh, who uh, lost their lives because of this last wave. I don't uh, believe personally that we'll ever have uh, that information. But there is no doubt in my mind that China's early, aggressive, and determined action in that first year and a half saved many lives in China. Uh, so uh, when it comes, this introduces a larger question of, of, of several kinds. One is uh, the necessity for global approaches to problems that are intrinsically global. And in today's world, that has to engage with China, it has to engage with Europe, it has to engage with America, it has to engage with Africa, it has to engage with South America, it has to engage with the rest of Asia. Literally, everyone has to be able to come together uh, in order to make the best effort against uh, a threat. Uh, a very uh, serious question is about vaccine production capacity. I think that this is a problem that is solvable, but will not be solved overnight. But we need vaccine production capacity in many, many parts of the world. We cannot rely on any country exporting uh, vaccines during a time of emergency. No political leader can afford to do that. And basically, we need to be pre-positioning capacity in order to have a successful uh, global response. What I would hope is that if we can have honest dialogue of both successes and failures, that there's an opportunity for mutual learning, not for the purpose of recrimination, not for the purpose of pointing fingers, but rather to better prepare for the next time. And there will be a next time. So actually, I was told I run the show, but I'm lost currently. I don't know how much, how much time. time do we have. There will be a next time, but not Pardon? tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so, do we have one more? I have no, no. I want to give it to the to the audience, but I'm, there are so many hands. So one last question now. And yeah, it's hard for you. So, so you look at okay. They take the charming. Thank you so much. That yeah. makes sense. Uh, Dirk Lontner, Welten Online uh, freelance writer. I'm I'm just on a story, um, and in the story I'm asking myself or the person is asking, well, um, there are data, and these data um, you are looking to as the doctor, they are. Um, giving the choice to solve the lives of um, one-fifths. And the doctor says, or the person, or I don't know, the decision maker, if there is one, um, decides, no, I will not give any va va vaccination. And this is due to um, not uh, the, star the data, but the context of the data, yeah? the world situation. For example, a world situation where it is um, possible that all human life will disappear through um, catastrophes. But if a fifth is dying, well, a survival may be possible. So I'm on this story, on this question. I hope you got it. Um, maybe you can um, comment on it. Uh -huh. Well, thank you for the comment. Uh, I would just say, you know, stories are very important. Uh, and I think the challenge for experts, like those who believe they know the facts, the science, the evidence, is to be able also to convert those deeper truths in forms that are easily communicated, understood, easy to remember, and become a basis for personal belief. And the key is not to abstain from storytelling. The key is to use it in the service of scientific evidence and better decisions. So maybe that's a good point to end. That's a fantastic <laughs> end. Thank you very much.